the V&A is hugely significant to me as a place. I've been a visitor here for 50 of my 57 years, and I have work here in the dome of the ceramics galleries. I've got it, my biggest installation I've ever made. So I'm, I'm here in this building. I'm Edmund de Baal. I'm a potter. I've been a potter all my life. I'm also a writer about objects, and in particular porcelain. And um, I've been coming to the V&A uh, since I've been a child. So you can imagine the pleasure in being invited to, to make plates which are a response to some of the treasures of this collection. And what I've chosen to do is to think about the great story of porcelain, you know, how it begins in, in Jingdezhen in China almost a thousand years ago and then comes along the Silk Road and is, and is reinvented in Europe repeatedly. And what that means, that great story of, of, of migration and, and reinvention. And so I've chosen um, particular favourite objects from this incomparable collection, looked at them hard, very hard, and then with written sort of stories about each of these objects, layering one text, one kind of fragmentary storytelling on top of another, fragments of quotations and, and dates and storytelling about how these objects were made, and ended up with these four places. Begin with an amazing piece of Chinese porcelain from Jingdezhen. Jingdezhen in, in China, where porcelain is really invented. It's blue and white. It's got this brilliant blue cobalt decoration, which is so vivid. And these are the kinds of objects that were made in their tens and tens of thousands um, from the 11th century onwards. This one is from the early 17th century. It's a kendi. It's made specifically for the Western market. And you can see that it's been mounted, probably in the year it arrived here, in, with this extraordinary 17th century Dutch silver. So what you've got is Chinese porcelain wrapped up in, in European silver of, of real vigour. Uh, these two things, cultures coming together. Here, what I do is to quote a beautiful section of, of, of the journals of Marco Polo the great Venetian traveller, when he comes to China and he comes to the city of Jingdezhen and, and, and he's amazed, he calls it Tinju, the city, and he cannot believe the tens and tens of thousands of this uh, porcelain that's being made, because at that moment, porcelain in the West is white gold. It's the most valuable thing, commodity possible. And he talks about the city, walking through the city and seeing uh, thousands of these beautiful pieces being made and he cannot believe it. So we've got Marco Polo, we've got gold and we've got the name of Jingdezhen, this great city, um, on my plate. So this is the beginning of my, my journey of porcelain. So here we are in Europe and this is my next piece. It's made in Meissen. And so if I wanted to choose a first piece of European porcelain, I would choose something from Meissen. Which is where this um, great mystery of how to make porcelain was, was cracked at the very beginning of the 18th century. And so what you see here is, is an extraordinary, exquisite delight in, in white gold in this new material. You see this ex extraordinary precision, this beautiful scrolling foliage that comes round these unbelievably uh, fine handles. What they're making here for the great emperor, the great elector of Saxony, Augustus the Strong, who is this great collector of porcelain, what you're, what you're proving by making this thing is that you're a country uh, and a city that can rival the emperor of, of China thousands of miles away. It's amazing. And on my plate, I, I quote the first moment when they open the kiln um, and see, um, see the very first white cup coming out. And the person who opens the kiln says it's, it's as white as Narcissus. It's a beautiful phrase. And, and I've got the, the whole here, all the, the records from the kiln when they open it up and they say the first object is album et pellucidum, white and translucent. And this is white and translucent. This is 1715, one of the earliest pieces of porcelain made in the West. 
And there on the other side, again, this is the cup with the cover, drawing all this story back into this plate. So, of course, I have to have Wedgwood. I mean, these are plates which are made by Wedgwood. And Wedgwood really matters to any potter because he's the person who kind of begins to think again about how, how to, um, about technology, about how to sell ceramics, about how to, how to make different kinds of skills come together within a ceramic object. And so what I've chosen is the first day vase, this wonderful series of vases that he threw himself um, in 1769, when he opens his great factory of Etruria in Stoke-on-Trent, on the banks of a new canal, and he, he creates his factory and he says, this is going to be a, a, like Etruria, it's going to be a new place where arts and commerce come together. And it's a magnificent vase and it's, it's full of the writing story of, 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 of why it's been made and how it's been made. So this is my homage to the great Wedgwood, I'm not sure if he'd approve, but I've written Etruria down, and then the text from his first day in 1769 on this, on this plate. And there, again, is, is the, the gilded um, a seal, really, which talks to the first day vows of Wedgwood. Out of all the thousands of possible pieces of Wedgwood ceramics that I could choose, I wanted something which, which had his his autograph had his, his hand intimately involved with it. So that's why I chose this particular object uh, to, to talk to in my plate. And then of course, Wedgwood and v &A. So that's my homage to this great uh, pioneering potter. It's always personal, but for my fourth plate, my final plate, I've chosen something that gives me huge delight. It's the first piece of porcelain made in England. It's an extraordinary story. It's made by a great Quaker apothecary called William Cookworthy, uh, who, who walks up a hill um, in the 1730s and sees white clay under his feet and takes it home and begins an interminable series of tests to try and understand how he can make porcelain. And finally, white earth, he says, becomes white porcelain and and these are the very first pieces and unlike that fine delicate piece of mycin this is is pretty heavy <laughs> it's an english piece of porcelain and you've got the clay there you can feel the, the the roughness of this clay but there rather beautifully inside is the chemical symbol for tin because of course that's the the symbol of of, of cornwall and plymouth um, and what you've got is you've got cobalt decorations. This is from 1770 when he just begins his factory. And you've got the cobalt decoration and it's, it's, it, it's kind of all right. <laughs> it's not terribly good. And the handle has slumped just a little bit. It's just hanging on there. But sort of just hanging on there is what English porcelain does. It's not as perfect as Ginger Jen. It's not as perfect as Meissen. And so what I'm honouring here is something very beautiful, which is, um, is trying to reach towards porcelain. And, and I write with some tenderness here in my plate about him. He, he, you know, he translates philosophy about white uh, mystical ideas. Um, he talks about the hill where he finds its first piece of white clay, China earth. Here is his mug, his Plymouth porcelain mug in gold. I hope he'd be pleased. Um, but this is my fourth part of my, my journey into the history of porcelain, my journey here to, to the V&A. And you might overlook this, walking past all these great treasures that are around us, but actually there's something beautiful and special and deeply, deeply modest in this, in this endeavour, which I really wanted to honour. It's an object of, of, of great, beautiful tenderness, I think, about this wonderful material. I'm incredibly moved, actually, because I suppose because it, it brings together just decades and decades thinking about how pots move through the world and the people who have made them, thought about them, written about them, used them, 
reinvented them. And because I love the VNA, <laughs> you know, I've looked at these things since I was a kid. It's a sort of wonderful way of, of just sort of really being in touch with those stories that matter and being able to sort of do something new about bringing them into a slightly different dimension.